Let's say we are building an Amazon like e-commerce website and let's say we're building this in early 2000s. This way we will understand what were the problems faced during that time because of which NoSQL databases had to be created. Let's focus only on one functionality of the website, the shopping cart. We will build this using a very straightforward three-tier architecture. There'll be UI which talks to your application instance in the backend also called as server instances and the data is stored in a SQL database. Typically, a database in production will also have a copy of it, a running replica, so that if the primary goes down, you still have a copy of the data with you. The replication between these two databases will be using asynchronous replication, which means whenever there are writes from your application to the database, the database first stores it in its own disk, returns an okay response, which is a successful response, and then behind the scenes, the data is replicated from the leader database to the replica database. Uh, terms master and slave were used to define the setup, but it's no longer considered appropriate. So we'll just use the terms leader and replica. The schema for this is also very simple and straightforward. We have a user table with a user ID and a bunch of columns related to the user. We'll have a product table with the product ID and bunch of columns related to the product. And we'll have a cart table where we'll have the mapping of the user ID and all the product IDs that the user has stored in their shopping cart. Now, this architecture has two main problems. One is high availability and other is scale. So the problem of high availability is mainly in the context of fault tolerance. So let's go back to our architecture. What happens when our leader database becomes unavailable? In such cases, we have to do two things. One, we have to go to the replica database change its config to say that no longer replicate the data from leader database. Secondly, we need to go to the application server itself, change its config to point to the replica database instead of the leader database. And for the changes to take effect, we have to restart the application server. And while we are doing this change, the application itself will be unavailable for the users. That means the shopping cart functionality will not work until all these changes are done. Let's say our website becomes very popular and is being accessed by tens of millions of users. In this case, in the context of database, there are a lot of problems that we will face for the scaling. So our database is generally just a process deployed on some virtual machine. And that virtual machine will have limited IO capacity, limited disk and limited CPU. So let's say instead of a single application server, we are horizontally scaling the number of servers that we have to let's say 100. Now, if each of these servers have a connection pool with the database of 10. That means now the database will have 1000 number of active connections, which this virtual machine or the database process might not be able to handle. Also, if tens of millions of users are concurrently accessing the database, that means there are a huge number of bytes that have been written and read. A virtual machine might not have a capacity to support those many IO operations. The second is limited disk storage. As the name suggests, we might not have enough disk capacity to store the data of tens of millions of users, though practically this is not a major concern. The third one is the CPU capacity. Every time we fire a query, both the read query or the write query for the database, the database might have to create an index or might have to go into an index, find out the records, might have to do the joins, might have to do some locking, might have to do some processing on that data. So for all these queries, CPU is required. So if you have tens of millions of operations being done simultaneously, then maybe our CPU will not be able to catch up. So we have these two problems that we need to solve. One straightforward way to do this is vertically scale our database, which means let's say we have our primary database, uh, which used to have uh, 32 CPU cores and 64 gigs of memory. We, will up we can upgrade that to 64 uh, CPU cores and 128 gigs of memory. Again, this is not very straightforward. Uh, this whole operation uh, is a very manual effort uh, and again requires a downtime for our application. So every time we have to make any changes to our database, we have to restart our application servers. So one way to avoid that is to add a proxy. Proxy is a service which sits between our application servers and the database itself. So that anytime a database goes down, you can just change the proxy configuration to switch over to the different database. And another benefit of proxy is it can do connection pooling, which means it can limit the number of connections that are being made to the database. 
The third one is load balancing. So you can have multiple replica databases and anytime there are reads that are fired to the proxy, the proxy will just load balance all the reads uh, between multiple read replicas. And read replicas can scale horizontally and you can scale the number of reads that your application can have uh, just by using a simple load balancing. That brings us to two solutions that we tried out to scale our traditional single node databases. One was vertical scale, which again required us to do some manual efforts as well as it impacted our availability. In addition, this requires us to buy expensive hardware, which is about treating our servers like pets versus cattle. And the second solution, which involved a proxy, can help us scale our uh, read throughput, but our write throughput is still constrained. And that involves even more problems when there are a lot of transactions and indexes and joins involved. So let's see if we can find any patterns or observations which can help us build a different type of database which can uh, solve these issues for us. So the first observation we saw was manually scaling up any database is going to be challenging. So let's try scaling out instead, which means partitioning your database into multiple databases. Let's convert this initial architecture of a single database instance into an architecture with multiple database instances. So we'll call these partitions. Each of these partitions will have one third of the data because we have three partitions here and all the queries that go to the database will go via proxy and the proxy is the service which will route the query to the right partitions. Right? For example, if it is for user one, it might go to partition one. If it is for user two, it will go to partition two and so on and so forth. If we are able to do this, then we can theoretically scale our database to 3x the load right, of both reads as well as writes. And in the future, if we want to further keep scaling this out, we can just keep adding more and more partitions and our, the our database should be able to scale out with it. The second observation we have is, uh, we are talking about Amazons and Googles in the early 2000s. Uh, these companies did not use very expensive hardware. Uh, the scaling requirements were so high that they had to use commodity machines. And the problem with commodity machines is they fail frequently, right? So the failure rate for a commodity server will be much higher than the failure rate of an expensive server. So of course our, our servers can fail anytime. So let's add some backup servers to our primary partitions. Uh, this is very similar to what we did for single node databases. And similar to what we did for single node database, let's also set up the replication between the leader and the follower. Uh, and here we have two options. One is asynchronous replication, uh, but we, if we do that, it will cause us the same problems that we had with single node SQL, uh, which means whenever there is a write to the system, so let's say in this case, the write is for a user, uh, which resides in this particular partition, the write will go to the leader first, the leader will uh, write it to the disk, acknowledge with a response, and then behind the scenes, there'll be asynchronous replication. And in this case, if the leader goes down, then uh, the system will be unavailable for one third of the users. And also, since this replication is asynchronous, there could be last few seconds of data, which could be permanently lost uh, because that data has not yet reached the follower. So let's try synchronous replication. Here, let's say there is, um, again, the same write goes to this partition. In this case, the leader will synchronize the data with the follower first. And only once the follower has given a successful response to it, it will write its own disk and then return the response back to the server. Even with this setup, we have a problem. Because we are using commodity machines, which fail frequently, it is possible that one of these two nodes go down at any point in time. So either the leader could go down or the follower could go down. And in both of the cases, the writes to this partition will completely stop which means one third of the users again will not have access uh, to this particular functionality. One way to resolve this is to create a quorum set. What this means is instead of two nodes, we will have three nodes, one leader and two replicas. For every write which comes from the server, we'll try to write it to all three nodes, but we'll wait only for two of them to acknowledge. So as long as more than half of the number of nodes in a quorum set acknowledge the change, that means this is a successful write. So for every write, even if one of the nodes in a particular partition set is unavailable, our system as a whole still continues to operate well 
continues to be available and continues to be functional. And now, since our whole partition set, which in this case three nodes, all of them have the same data, whenever there are reads requested to a particular partition, we can route that read to any of these nodes and all of them will return the same data. So this also helps with the read scaling along with the partition themselves. And we'll apply the same quorum set functionality to all the partitions that we have in our database. There are a lot of nuances and complexity to how this is implemented and we'll cover all of this in later videos. For the third and the final observation, let's understand the access pattern of our functionality. So here we have the architecture that we have built so far where there are three partitions each with their own partition set or the quorum set and the proxy routes the requests both reads and writes based on the user id in this case the partitioning technique could be simple as taking a hash of a user id doing a modulo with the number of partitions that we have in this case three and whatever the value turns out to be route that request to corresponding partition so in this example all the data for user id u28 lands in partition 1 and we apply the same technique of doing a hash on the product id doing a modulo operation and depending on the data let's say for the product id p567 the modulo operation returns a result of 1 and that's why it goes in the second partition but now the problem here is if we try to fetch the cart for a particular user in this case user id u28 since the product IDs that are part of the shopping cart for this particular user lie in other partitions, we will have to do a cross partition join, which means the table of this partition needs to join with table of this partition and table of this partition. And of course, that is a very inefficient operation. This problem becomes even bigger if we have hundreds of partitions in our system. So let's see if we can simplify this. So since the shopping cart for a user will be fetched only based on the user ID, we can simplify this by copying over the data of the product into the cart table itself. So in this case, instead of saving only the product IDs, we will also save the product name, product image, and couple of other details that are required to be shown on the page itself. So now all data for this particular user for the shopping cart lies in a single partition. So now instead of doing a cross partition join, we can only have the query for a single partition. And of course, this is applicable to all users in the system, right? So one third of the users will have their entire shopping cart saved in partition one and same thing for partition two and partition three. And if we think about it, this pattern of saving the entire data that is required to be shown on the screen for a particular user can be applied in multiple use cases. For example, the order history page. So again, when the user goes to order history, we can just fetch all the orders of a particular user using just the user ID. So here there is a user ID and all the details of that particular order are saved as part of the value itself. So now whenever the user wants to fetch the historical orders, the query will always go into a single partition. Similarly, all the saved payment methods for a particular user, we are always going to fetch it by user ID. So you can just save all of it as part of a single value, saved addresses, all the addresses of a particular user can be saved as a single value. And one more straightforward example is the product page. So once we have the product ID, we can just fetch all the details of a product from a single partition because all the details can be saved in the value itself. Similarly, if someone opens a particular product and you want to showcase what are the related items to that product, you can just have a related products table where you have a product ID, and then all the related products, including the name, images, ratings, etc., can just be stored in a single value. You can just query a single partition and fetch all the related items to that particular product, which in this case is P4555. So if we use this pattern and change our schema, then scaling the database horizontally is very easy, right? Because you do not have to do cross partition queries. And it will always be able to fetch the value for a particular key using a single partition in a very predictable amount of time. Conceptually, this architecture, you can think of it as a giant distributed hash map where you are looking up the values based on the keys and you are able to fetch them in a predictable latency. And with that, we have architected our first NoSQL database 
which conceptually works very similar to how DynamoDB works. So DynamoDB is one of the NoSQL databases of type key value, which is built from the ground up for high scale and high reliability. So NoSQL is just an umbrella term for a lot of non-relational databases. So key value is just one of the types of NoSQL database. There are multiple other types, namely wide column database, where Google's Bigtable was one of the first ones, which was created also in early 2000s, uh, which we'll go over in the next video. There are document databases uh, like MongoDB, Firestore, and Elasticsearch, and there are graph databases like Neo4j and dgraph. Now, few of these NoSQL databases are used for general purpose application. For example, DynamoDB, Firestore, MongoDB are used for almost all kinds of applications, while databases like Redis is used for caching and queuing, and Elasticsearch, which is a NoSQL document DB, but it's generally used for full text search. And we'll go into each of these databases internal workings and uh, understand their trade-offs in later videos. So when do we use NoSQL, right? Or in other words, what are the advantages of NoSQL? So as we saw in our example, when you're dealing with very high scale, which means hundreds of millions of records, you have a very high rate of reads and write operations, and you still want to have consistent latencies for all your queries. And when the access patterns are known upfront, which means you are able to model your schema in such a way that it makes it easy for you to create queries where you can fetch all the data with predictable performance. So any use case which have these criteria can be a good fit for NoSQL use. Of course, nothing comes for free. Uh, we have a lot of trade-offs to make when we use NoSQL systems. The first trade-off is data duplication. So in this example, we can see that the product ID 567, which represents an N95 mask, is added to the shopping cart of multiple users, which could be into thousands of users. And we are duplicating a lot of data across all these users. Now, in terms of storage, that is not a problem because storage is cheap. But we have another problem where we want to change this data. For example, if the product seller or the merchant decides to change the image of that product, which means to fix this, you will have to go to all the users in all the partitions, search if that product exists. If so, update the product image. And that is why the correct domain modeling, right, creating the right schema is very critical when you're using a NoSQL system. The second problem is the eventual consistency. So we spoke about how each of the partition will have a quorum set where we attempt to write to all three nodes. And once we get an acknowledgement from two of the nodes, we return the response back to the client. Let's take an example where a partition has a key value of X and two, and we want to change that value to three. It is possible that two of the nodes are able to update the values to three, but let's say for some reason, there was a lot of delay in the data reaching the third node. Now, if after this, there is a read that comes for the same key, which is X. And if the proxy decides that it wants to forward that request to the third node, it is possible that the third node returns an older value. And eventually, typically within a couple of seconds itself, the data reaches the third node. And that is why this is called eventually consistent. So this quorum set or three nodes were not consistent with each other, but eventually given enough amount of time, all three of them will have the same data. So your application will now have to deal with that. And the third trade-off of using NoSQL is we will miss out on a lot of SQL features. So most NoSQL databases are accessible only via some custom API. So you cannot use your generic uh, SQL query language. And the second problem is there are restrictions of what functionalities you can achieve using this particular domain modeling. So let's take an example where we uh, store details of an account. So now you cannot have a query which says, get me all the accounts where balance is greater than 500 because the proxy doesn't have an index on the balance column. It only has the understanding of how to route the queries based on the account ID. Another problem is cross partition support. So with the same example, if you want to transfer the balance from one account, which resides in partition one 
to other account which resides in partition 2 then of course this will have to be implemented as a transaction and as soon as you have a transaction where there are two different nodes you need a, a transaction manager and thus initially when NoSQL databases were built they did not have support for this cross partition transactions and the last one for the SQL feature is the referential integrity if this was implemented in a traditional SQL database you can have an author ID in the book table as a foreign key to the author ID in the author table but in NoSQL systems you will just dump the author ID as one of the fields in the value of your book table and there is no check if that author ID really is present in the system so if you have to do some checks you have to do it at an application level and that brings the end to this video uh, the SQL itself we can scale it with vertical scaling uh, read replicas which we saw as one of the two solutions there are other solutions that we will go through in the next videos there is no SQL where we only covered the key value database and even within that we only covered the DynamoDB there are a lot more databases which cover the entire umbrella of NoSQL we'll go through these also in the next videos and in recent years there have been a new type of databases called new SQL databases which have the table structure of traditional database and yet they are able to scale like NoSQL databases so overall very vast landscape there are a lot of concepts and databases to be learned stay tuned for the next set of videos on NoSQL series thanks a lot for watching and see you in the next one